What you see here is the largest iron ore mine in the world. It has now produced some 500 million tons of iron ore, which is exported all over the world. And that iron ore is a tribute. It's a tribute to those who came before, those who were prepared to come into this inhospitable country to bring in water, to bring in power, to bring in manpower, and to mine it out. And it's a tribute to them and to their wives and to their children. And this hole now represents the future for us in Australia. It represents education for our children. It represents work for ourselves. I hope you're going to enjoy this story, this tribute to those who came before us. Five hundred million tonnes of high-grade iron ore production achieved in 1988, Australia's bicentennial year. No matter what year you're watching this film, you're looking at history. You're looking, in fact, at a reconstruction of how the Mount Newman iron ore project began. A reconstruction by the original people and the original vehicle. In the late 1950s, Stan Hilditch and his wife, Ella, scoured the Pilbara in their elderly Ford truck in search of manganese. In the Ophthalmia Range, near Wheelie Wally Springs, they came across an excellent example of Bruno's Band, a clearly visible seam of high-grade hematite underlying possible Brockman ore. And this encouraged Stan to continue. Look, Ella, I think we'll have another closer look at this. Looks pretty good. Yes, but it looks a bit rough going to me. Rough going it certainly was, but then it always was. No roads, no tracks, no fuel, no food, no water, no air conditioning. Just a conviction they were on the right track and a dogged determination to prove it. Ella spent long hours in the truck with her embroidery while Stan was exploring. His explorations led to the discovery of Mount Welbeck. There wasn't much manganese but it contained one of the richest high-grade iron ore deposits in the world. Stan could hardly believe it. And many potential developers refused to. At last, after many disappointments, the great international firm Amex came to the party. Others followed, and the black and white TV cameras watched the Premier Sir David Brand and dignitaries from BHP, Cell Trust, Mitsuishi Ito of Japan, CSR, Pilbara Iron, and of course Amex, signed the co-venturers agreement at the old Adelphi Hotel in 1966. The international construction company Bechtel Pacific was engaged to supervise the construction of the whole project. Surveyors moved into a barren point of land at Port Hedland to mark out the ore handling area. It was called Nelson Point. Today, it's the site of a huge, sophisticated ore handling complex with a wharf capable of loading two giant ore carriers at the same time. When Bechtel first arrived, it was mud, 
mangroves and spinifex. Bechtel was given the enormous task of coordinating the construction of the mine, the railroad and the port, and it set about the job with the skills of long experience. The personality of Port Hedland was about to undergo a dramatic change. Three kilometres to the north, right on the coast, another team of surveyors began work on a sandy, windy desert. This was to be the company town at Cook Point. The port had to be connected to the mine, 426 rugged and inhospitable kilometres to the south. The task of constructing the connecting railroad was entrusted to MKMO, Morrison, Ludson, Mannix and Oman. And after extensive soil testing, the rail bed had to be established. Through the Chichester Ranges, cuttings had to be blasted. At the mine site, the long, low hill which Stan Hildridge had proved to contain a heart of iron waited for the onslaught of steel and explosives to come. First, bulldozers worked on the side of the hill to carve out the haulage road to take ore from the mining benches to the crusher. 75-ton haul-packed dump trucks, considered gigantic in those days, filled in the nooks and crannies. material came from the top of the hill as engineers constructed the first mining benches. The crushers, primary and secondary, were lowered into their excavated pits. Buildings went up in the industrial and administrative areas and while this was happening, things began to move at the town site. The town's first foreman, Charlie Snell, was in charge of the nursery. Charlie and his team planted 70,000 trees. Mount Whaleback at this time was still covered with trees and spinifex. It was destined to become a huge hole in the ground. Back at Port Hedland, the two biggest dredges in the world, the Cockway Maru and the Alameda, began deepening the harbour and approaches to allow ore carriers to enter the harbour and turn around before berthing at the ore loading wharf. Hard red spoil from the harbour bed poured over the Nelson Point tidal flats to a depth of up to 10 metres. The mangroves and spinifex disappeared. Finally, a broad, level area of almost 100 hectares was ready to receive buildings and equipment for ore handling. Materials for the ore stackers and car damper were carefully laid out in position, and the girders of the tertiary crusher stood like a modern steel parthenon at the southeastern end. From what was a deep hole dug into the harbour silt, heavy concrete foundations supported the assembly of what is now the number one car damper, imported from the United States after the completion of the Oroville Dam in California. Over at the northwestern end of the ore handling area, piles for the incipient shiploading wharf are thumped into position by a steam-driven pile driver. Not far away, a diesel pile driver starts the building of the first railway bridge over the East Turner River, an indication that preliminary testing of the rail bed is complete and the steel is about to be laid. Huge stockpiles of material were assembled at the rail welding yard. 
cant plates by the 10,000. Drums of spikes and rail anchors. 900 kilometers of heavy duty BHP steel rail stacked meticulously in neat squares. And a timber sleeper for every 30 centimeters of track or 850,000 sleepers in all. The rails are welded into 400 meter long strings at the flashbutt welter and stored in the rail yard ready for use. The train, with its specially adapted rail cars, carries 16 strings of 400 meters each. MKMO set a world record of seven kilometers of track laid in just under 12 hours, a record which stood for many years. Hard work in the full glare of the sun. In those days, almost every job was hard work, with the goal of completing the project on schedule. My Newman owes a lot to the skills and sheer hard work and determination of everyone concerned in those vital construction days. In early 1969, the two-year task was completed. The mine complex was already sending train loads of ore to the port, where they were unloaded and stacked into position. On the 1st of April 1969, the Western Australian Minister for Industrial Development, Mr Charles Court, presided over the first shipment of ore as the carrier Osumi Maru sailed for Japan. Three months later, the Governor-General, Sir Paul Hasluck, officially opened the mine. And I've been given the honour to declare the Mount Newman project officially open. The ceremony was transmitted by satellite and watched by guests at dinners in New York, London, Tokyo and all Australian capital cities. Mount Newman was on the way. But the dust didn't settle there. Over the years, Mount Whaleback grew progressively lower as the mining benches covered more and more territory. It does give me very great pleasure to officially declare open this secondary primary crusher at Newman. A second crusher system was commissioned in late 1971. New conveyors took the ever-increasing production of ore to a second loadout tunnel. traffic. 140 ore cars, a huge length in those days, almost one and a half kilometers. By 
1976, a new car damper capable of handling three ore cars at a time was sending the ore on its way to the stackers and on to the ore carriers, now more than twice the size of the early ones. As the mine grew, more waste had to be removed and in 1979, the beneficiation plant was built to upgrade low-grade contact ore. Higher water usage at the mine in the town meant husbanding of water supplies, and a bold project began to recharge the underground aquifers artificially. As the project entered the 1980s, the Ophthalmia Dam not only recharged the aquifer, but provided beach and sailing facilities for the inland town. A brief flashback shows the original town, and a bicentennial view shows the results of the early labours of Charlie Snell. It's almost easier to see the trees now than the houses. The bicentennial year has seen a dramatic increase in progress and efficiency. It's now possible to handle ore 32 metres below the water level. The in-pit crusher and conveyor system has provided huge economies in the disposal of waste material. Freighting has been increased and made more economical by the use of locotrol trains up to three kilometres long. Contracts have been signed for increased use of the high-grade Maramamba ore on what is called Ore Body 29, alongside Mount Whaleback. Mount Newman is now the senior member of the iron ore family BHP Utah Minerals International. In addition to the huge reserves already proved in a number of ore bodies, Mount Newman Railroad and port facilities will now play their part in a new development at Yanti Kujina, where a trial batch of 200,000 tonnes has already been mined. In the meantime, negotiations are still continuing over the development of deposits at close by McCamey's Monster, a rich ore body for which Lang Hancock has held high hopes for many years, and from which its product will follow the same track which Mount Newman has pioneered for two whole decades. Extensive redevelopment of Port Hedland Harbour has seen ships of up to 250,000 or more tonnes comfortably loading ore at the upgraded wharf facilities. Future export tonnage of high-grade iron ore from Mount Newman can only be measured in astronomical terms. But in the meantime, Here's looking at the first 500 million.